everybody. <laughs> we seem to have uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde weather this month and uh, have woken up in November. <laughs> so uh, thank you for coming out. And I'll say right up front, I'm really nervous. Uh, I'm not used to public speaking. I've done it before, and it seemed just to go well. But um, So hopefully today will go well, too, and you'll find something that you can take home and use. Um, <clears throat> so. Like they said, I earn my, uh, I'm a writer, but I earn my living as a ghostwriter. And so I write for other people. I help them tell their stories in ways that hopefully get a little bit closer to the truth that they feel, but maybe sometimes they don't recognize. And I help them tell their story in ways that are entertaining, uh, have a little bit more life to them than uh, perhaps just a flat telling would, would do. And uh, ideally, I help them get closer to finding an agent, finding a publisher, and then moving on in that process uh, to where they actually have their book in their hands and they get to experience the nerves of standing in front of a group of people <laughs> hoping they read something really great. Um, so my talk today is on uh, craft. And to me, uh, if you look it up in the dictionary, usually the dictionary just sort of says, you know, uh, very straightforward. It's something you do with your hands. It's something you make. It's a craft. It's knitting. It's crocheting. It's, it's something like that. Uh, I take it a little bit further to say that it's really two parts. So <clears throat> the first part is mastering the tools and skills of your work. So for me as a writer, that's dialogue, characterization, description, um, learning how to design a story. Uh, story structure to me is an incredibly important part of my process. And it's always the first part of my process after I've gotten to know the client, gotten to know their story, and, and, and a lot of the details. Um, so those are, those are my tools and, and skills that I have to have. And every writer has to have them. If they want to be a good writer, these are the things that they need to have. So then the next piece of it is, is when we talk about somebody being a craftsperson, it's usually not a generic term. We're not randomly saying, <laughs> you know, this person is a craftsperson, period, and it doesn't carry any weight. Usually it's, it, we're really showing some respect to that person and their ability. And, and what we're showing is that they not only have the mastery of their tools uh, and the skills of their work, but they're also able to put them to uh, use to create something of lasting and unique value. And if I hit the right button, <laughs> nope. It's good to hit the first wrong button early, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so really, I, I want to focus on the second part of this, because no matter what you do, I mean, you know, if you work at a nonprofit, there's points where you have to be creative. You're going to apply for grants, and you have to be competitive about how you apply for those grants. And you have to dig deep into your creativity and say, here is, is uh, why me, my organization, uh, whatever the case may be, deserves your money. Um, and if you're somebody, whether you're a photographer or you work like I do, um, y you have to be able to get beyond just having skills. You have to show the people who you want to work for, who you want to view your art, uh, view your work, that you can go beyond that, that, that you actually uh, are a craftsperson, that you have, are capable of uh, creating something for them that is of a lasting and unique value. Now, by value, a lot of people often kind of interpret that to mean money. And I, I really don't. I try and stay away from using value as a synonym for money. Um, because I really see it more as, as projecting something outward as opposed to bringing something inward. And when you're talking about money, you're talking about, I want to make more money for me. When I talk about value, I want to create something of, of great and lasting and uni unique value for my client. This is something that I want to give to them. Um, so the way that I you know, define my value is, uh, or value basically, is that it uh, provides a unique solution to a problem for someone else or for yourself, um, or really any other attribute that's beneficial to you and or someone else, um, hopefully someone else. Um, but we all know that, that art <laughs> is often done alone. And so we have to be satisfied sometimes with uh, when you send something out and it gets rejected that you are happy in the creative process, planting the flower for the sake of planting the flower. Um, and then I, there's kind of two ways that I, I d look at it, too. There's the intrinsic, which is 
you know, enjoying doing it, enjoying planting the flower for the sake of planting the flower. And the second is the extrinsic, which is that value that you deliver to another person. How I measure the value is its originality, usefulness, uh, ability to entertain. But then a big piece of that is the ability to solve a problem for someone. So uh, my work for a client begins long before I've ever gotten a client. Uh, <clears throat> I have a few different channels for getting work. Uh, one of them is publishers. One is uh, different agencies. And then sometimes, very, very rarely, uh, my website which uh, <laughs> is a lot of color. <laughs> and having the name James Buchanan, uh, people tend to remember it, but they also remember there's a president, uh, a Nobel uh, economist, and there is also another writer of gay erotic uh, <laughs> short stories <laughs> who's quite a bit more famous than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> So I, I reasoned that I don't want to compete with any of those people, so I went with something br to brand. And so I had to you know, use my creativity and come up with something. And I've always liked Orchard. I, I like the word Orchard itself. I like what it says. Um, you know, it's a fertile place. It's, it's you know, fruit, it's apples, it's peaches. It's, it's things that people really, really like. And so my website really is the first place where my potential clients get to meet me. And so I want it to be a welcoming place, a place where there's photos, not you know some pro headshot of me, but you know uh, this one at a wedding, out uh, doing something. And then you know everybody's aspiration when they come to my website and when they work with me is they want to see their book in one of these very beautiful old bookstores. So it creates that sort of asp aspirational piece. Um, so it's so my website is not you know, where I get work, it's, it's more of a tool for helping me get work. So I'll get referred uh, clients by publishers or agents. Um, and the, the next piece is when, the, when I get this, there's usually some uh, explanation of the scope of the work. Here's their story in a broad stroke. Here's who they are. Here's what they do. Um, sometimes it, inv it includes a little bit of what they want to accomplish uh, with what they're doing. You know, if it's a business book, then you know, they all say, I want to be a thought leader, right? So they want to be the next Seth Godin. Uh, and so that changes my perspective of how I'm going to help them. But a lot of the writing that I do is uh, memoir and narrative nonfiction. And for those people, it's a little bit different. It's a lot more personal. They've often been through some pretty severe trauma. Uh, for some of them, it's lifelong trauma. And they've reached a point where they believe they can tell their story and they want to tell their story and they want you know it's interesting when you talk to them for the first time and you say what are your goals and they say well I want to be published <laughs> 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 and then you really got to dig a little bit deeper and you've got to get um, closer to really what is it that they th that they want uh, so that you can you know be this uh, do a better job of presenting to them how you can kind of solve that problem for them. Because, like I said, there's lots of ghost writers out there. And they all can do the same thing. Um, they're all pretty good writers. I like to think I'm a little bit better than most. But, um, and so what is it that's going to distinguish me that's, that's going to make them see me as, as unique, as, as holding a unique solution to them? So uh, like I said, this initial stage is usually competitive. There's five, sometimes 20 other writers who are sending in pitches. Sometimes I'm the only person who's sending in a pitch, but I know that if they don't like what they see and I don't really ring, you know, click all the boxes and ring a bell, that they're going to go on to the next person. Um, and I also have a deadline. Sometimes it's, can you have this pitch to me later today? Sometimes it's tomorrow. Sometimes it's a few days. Uh, rarely is it a week. Rarely is it two weeks. And we're talking about, um, since I can write about two, maybe three books a year, we're talking about relatively large sums of money that I have to convince somebody I'm worth uh, spending that money on. So I, uh, I look at their summary. Um, you know, I, I try and learn as much as I can about, you know, uh, really identify the scope and the, you know, what they're, they're, they say they're looking for. And then I have to sit down and I have to prepare my pitch. And I don't do this in email because this is a drafting process. An email doesn't have the tools to draft. 
So I'm doing it in Word, and of course, that's what I look at. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, as Monty said, the tyranny of the blank page, which, uh, <laughs> and it is, and we all deal with this. Uh, if you have clients and you have to make pitches, this is your starting point. If you are filling out an application for a grant, that's your starting point. If you're a photographer, starting point. So this is, for really most of us, if not all of us, this is where we begin. And this is the biggest challenge that we face. Um, so what I do to try and, try and beat it <laughs> and engage my creativity um, is really kind of do that learning, but I, I look at this front page and I th or this page, and I think to myself, how do I present myself to the client as the owner of the unique solution to their problem, right? So I have lots of problems right now. I have a blank page, a lot of things running around in my head, uh, kids who need rides, <laughs> all that kind of stuff going on, um, and. But I really need to focus on what is, what is the truth of their problem? What is it that they need to have solved? Um, and what are they looking for so that I can provide, I can, I can display, I can show, right? The big thing in writing is you say, show, don't tell, right? I don't want to tell them that I'm the best solution. I want to show them that I'm the best solution. So I need to come up with a way to do that. Um, so I've got the right slide up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so again, it's about demonstrating value and unique value and the ability to create something that's lasting and, and unique and compelling and, um, and that kind of thing. And if I can do that, if you can do that well, consistently, so I'll lose more of these pitches than I'll win. But if I can do this consistently and I can do this well and I can have a thoughtful process and a framework, which is what I want to really kind of talk to you guys about, um, then I'm going to win more than I, l not, I'll lose more, but I'll still win I guess the, the way to phrase it, I'll win a bunch more than I would have otherwise. <laughs> um, and this also creates a, a higher perceived value coming from the client towards me. Um, and so in some instances, you can look at it one way as it gives you some leverage when you're discussing fee. So if they really believe that you have a unique solution, you can bump your fee up a little bit. That's not really my intention. My intention is to make sure that they're as dedicated to wanting to have to work with me as I can possibly get them because I, w I need their trust. Uh, if somebody's going to share the story of how their drug addicted mother used to beat them every day when they came home from school, uh, I don't want them thinking about how I used perceived value to get more money out of them. I want them to think this is a guy who's authentic. This is a guy who understands what I went through, who's taking the time to, to more deeply understand what I went through, and is going to present my story in a way that is respectful, um, as well as emotionally compelling, and tap into the empathy of the reader. Um, so to understand how I can be that unique solution, I have to understand their problem. I have to do a lot of homework. I have to do a lot of research. I, I become their Google stalker for a little while. <laughs> um, you know, business clients are easy because, or, you know, business book guys, because they're throwing their bios everywhere. <laughs> and some of them do public speaking, so I can see that. Other people, it's a little harder because they're not putting themselves out there. This is often the first time that they're putting themselves out there, the first time that they're telling their story. So it's more a little about intuition and something that I, that's called theory of the mind, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, but that has to do with understanding the emotional state of another person. And it's something that we all do. Um, so, uh, and I also understand that they, they you know, say I want to be published, but really they're looking for often a lot more. And, it, and all clients, they come to me and they're looking for some form of validation. They want to have their business idea validated, that it is truly smart, truly good. They want to know that the trauma that they suffered <coughs> was unique, was extraordinary, was as life-changing as, as they feel it was, and they want that to, to be respected and, and noted. Um, so if I can dig a, a little bit deeper in my research and push a little bit deeper to understand them, then I can do a much better job of of presenting why I, I hold the unique solution to their, to their problem. And I can do a better job creating an emotionally compelling pitch. 
the second piece is uh, creating a unique idea or set of ideas around their story. So you don't want to just say, you know, I understand you, um, I'm a good writer. You want to be able to say, I have some ideas, and these are ideas that we can act on right away. And uh, to do that, you have to understand that the, you know, the world of publishing is incredibly competitive right now. Um, it, it's actually mind-bogglingly <laughs> competitive, especially in the US. I'm having much better luck publishing my own work in places like France and Portugal and, uh, and Holland <laughs> than I am here in the United States. And I've seen one book that had about $10.5 million in pre-production funding for a movie based on the book fail to get an agent. And I was stunned. <laughs> so you really got to come up with something good. Um, and uh, and that, you know, the important piece of that is being able to push past cliches, get past the platitudes. Um, so for, you know, one project that I, I worked on, which was a narrative nonfiction about a young girl who survived the Holocaust in uh, Western Ukraine, um, you know, she has this incredible story of being separated from her mother. She survived alone, hiding in the woods for two winters. Um, and this was one of the deadliest places of the war. Uh, there was no, there were U Ukrainians fighting Ukrainians, fighting Poles, fighting Jews, what Jews were left, um, fighting Germans who were fighting everybody else. And it just, if you were a human being, just being out standing in a field was, was enough to, to, to get killed if you're a Jewish girl who's 11 years old. Uh, if nature doesn't get you and the cold does, then somebody's going to find you. And so what I wanted to do is you can't just tell another Holocaust story because as, as terrible as that is, if I go to a publisher and I say, I've got a Holocaust story, here's the, out, the outlines of it, they're going to say there's 10 people in line who have the same story. So I have to find something that, that is unique and compelling. And what I started out with was asking survivors, um, what do you do when you don't have hope, right? This, this young girl had no hope. It turned out at the, at the end of the war when the Soviets swept through, she and one other woman were the only survivors of people, 6,000 people were in the ghetto that they were in uh, near Lvov, uh, Ukraine. She and another woman, only two. And so I asked him, what is it that keeps you going? And, and she said, love. And she said, the survivor said, um, knowing that somebody loves you and they need you is what keeps you going. And so that became the theme of the book. And I turned that into um, really a story of the interplay of love and despair. And took, and this is not my thesis. This is one that I read somewhere else. And, and as all creators, we sort of stand on the shoulders of giants. but. I turned it into despair cannot exist in the presence of love, and love cannot exist in the presence of despair. So the story is not just about her survival, it's about that battle between love and despair going on within her. Um, and it worked. <laughs> and I got the job and uh, wrote what I think is a, is a pretty good book, um, and it's going to be published in September. So it's you know, exciting. Uh, and the same for, you know, if you're a cancer survivor, you know, I mean, it's, it's crazy to think that you can go through some horrible, unique experience and have an agent or a publisher say to you, sorry, I'm not interested. Um, so, uh, you know, so th th this, this is kind of that initial stage of, of the creative process where I have to understand that the obvious thing, this incredible story, isn't the thing that's going to create the story and, and succeed and accomplish the goals that everybody has for the story who are hiring me and paying me to work for, you know, I've been working on this now for about three or four years. So, um, you know, you better come up with something good. <laughs> uh, and that's a lot of pressure, right? And so that makes that blank page moment feel even more, okay, I've got to do something really, really good here. Um, so I go out, I do my homework, I learn as much as I can uh, about the client. Uh, I do this and, and really what I'm thinking about doing is, is uh, I'm, I'm filling the well that's in, in, in my brain that my conscious mind and my subconscious mind will, will use to work on. Um, and I, once the well is filled, I go back to the blank page and my mind projects this. <laughs> 
onto it. So I have to figure out a way to take this and turn it into an organized, uh, cohesive story that tells the client that I'm the unique solution <laughs> to their problem when I feel like I'm a mess. <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot of things that I do, and, and when I was kind of doing some research for this, there's one thing that I found that really kind of fits it well, and, and perhaps most of you are uh, familiar with it, but it's called the Graham-Wallace model. Uh, and, uh, you know, many years ago this fellow Graham-Wallace uh, described what he believes happens when people attempt to develop creative solutions for complex problems. And so that's what we all do. We're all, all day long trying to create uh, creative solutions to complex problems. And he has what he describes as uh, four stages of his model. Preparation, incubation, illumination, verification. Uh, so according to him, uh, the preparation part is really my homework part, right? It's where you prepare. You go out and you get your, your, your data or your, you know, your facts, you learn your story. Uh, all those kinds of things, and so I've already done that. The incubation is where you step back from the problem, and you, uh, you know, he says you contemplate it, which sounds like a front of mind thing, but for me, it's more. It happens in the subconscious, and then illumination is where. Well, that just turned on. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <And> Perfectly timed. <laughs> voila. Uh, and so illumination is where your, your subconscious mind starts firing ideas to your conscious mind. And then verification is where you act on it. You write it out and you see if it's any good and you use your conscious mind to kind of evaluate because your conscious mind is really good at evaluating things. Um, and so what I want to focus on is, is uh, uh, incubation and illumination. Um, so uh, there's a great book uh, written by Malcolm Gladwell uh, called Blink, and he is really kind of talking about this incubation, uh, in incubation and illumination stages. And so the name of the book is Blink, and he talks about this this concept of thin slicing, where he says that spontaneous decisions are often as good as, or even better than, carefully planned and considered ones. I have a, a little quibble, but I, I think he's mostly onto something there. Um, so. I, I try and use this in interviews that I do with people, which is about building trust, getting them into conversation, and not asking closed end uh, questions. It's about um, getting them to, to ju just start talking, to start trusting me and feel comfortable and start talking, which allows them to access you know, that deeper sub subconscious level of their mind. And all of a sudden, memories, thoughts, ideas start to come to the fore. And, uh, you know, I use this, uh, you know, the best example of using this in a powerful way. Uh, years ago for a project, I interviewed the surviving members of the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, and they were the Americans who went to Spain and fought on the side of the Spanish government against Francisco Franco, who was supported by Hitler and Mussolini. So they were the first Americans to fight fascism and Nazism just before World War II. And obviously that's a long time ago, and this is the late 90s, early 2000s, and these are rather old people. And uh, there were two in particular, Abe Smarodin and Lou Gordon, who've uh, passed, but uh, phenomenal people just to meet anyway. And I did one interview with them over the phone, and they would say, oh, I can't remember anything, uh, you know. And it's true, you know, when you talk to somebody who's been through trauma, especially war, they don't want to talk about it. And they repress the memories, and they have the story that they tell everybody, right? And so as a writer, you're trying to get past that. So I did this, these uh, phone interviews at first. Uh, built some trust. And then I said, listen, let me come to your house uh, or some place where you feel comfortable meeting and then let's have a conversation. They'd say, yeah, I don't know what you're going to get. You know, I mean, that's pretty much it. And I'd say, okay, well, let's, if you're willing, let's try. And they'll say, sure, I'll try anything. So I went to Lou's house, um, was there, and we did the interview, took five hours. And he told the story of starting with his social justice group when he was in school at Brooklyn High, went through uh, Spain, and then he was among the soldiers who invaded on D-Day, and then was among the soldiers that liberated the Dachau liberate, uh, concentration camp. And uh, it's an incredible story. He fought Nazism and fascism from the very 
beginning and saw it to its end and he saw the very th reason why he went to Spain, which was he knew that these concentration camps were already beginning to exist back in the mid-30s and he knew where Hitler was going because they'd done their homework. Um, and in that interview he played harmonica and sang, you know, songs. He cried. I cried. <laughs> um, it was painful, but it was beautiful. And it's captured, and I have it on tape, and the Smithsonian uh, is going to have it. Uh, Abe was the same thing. We met down in New York. They have a little closet, the Abraham Lincoln Brigade uh, archives, they call it, and it's a closet apartment. And he and his wife were there, and we talked for four hours. And the two of them were hysterical. Uh, he met his wife when he came back from Spain, and he went to tell uh, her parents that her brother had died, their son had died, and he was there when he had been killed. And he meets, uh, he does that and meets his future wife. <laughs> <laughs> and they finished, well, she finished more of his sentences than he of hers, but. <laughs> Uh, and it was, it was uh, an incredible experience. And, and that, to me, is what I call harvesting blanks, right? And that's the power of it. And it's this, this process of gaining trust and then getting people in a position where they're able to access their subconscious. So bringing it back to me preparing a, a pitch for a client, that is exactly what I'm trying to do to myself. <laughs> um, so uh, moving along. Um, and, you know, really a lot of the heavy, uh, heavy lifting is done in the subconscious. And there's uh, Malcolm Gladwell based part of his book on some work done by a fellow named Daniel Wagner who coined the term adaptive unconscious mind. And he says it's a series of mental processes such as memory, language, uh, learning, decision making, uh, goal pursuing, and a few other things. And to me, all of those things are feed into creativity. Those are all the elements of creativity. If you're going to create a recipe of what creativity is, it, memory, uh, your experiences feed into your creativity. And they're there just below the surface, always. Abe and Lou proved that to me. They're always there. And I'm sure that their, their experiences uh, fed into their lives in ways that they probably didn't really truly realize or connect. Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, it's that subconscious mind that, he, that uh, Wagner then says is able to uh, transform and interpret information and think in ways that are beneficial. Uh, he says one of the big ones is just survival. Uh, but, you know, I really think that the big one for us is being able to be creative and being able to access, uh, you know, incubate ideas and thoughts and impressions uh, when we don't even think that we're doing it. So to me, the conscious mind is more like a frenemy. Uh, if anybody has been through depression or knows somebody who's been through depression uh, or self-doubts, I think we've all been there. Uh, I do when I'm at the blank page. Um, and your front, the front of your mind, your conscious mind, is the one that says, you can't do this. What are you thinking? You're a fraud. <laughs> Why did you ever, you know, look at this. This is a blank page. Why did you ever agree to do this? <laughs> Go work for an insurance company, <laughs> right? Uh, and then it's also, it says, no, it's not too late for another drink. Uh, <laughs> and then for our creativity, it says, that's a great idea. Write that one down. And we'll come back tomorrow and pitch that to the client. And then you come back the next day. Not only do you probably not understand it, but you realize it's a horrible idea. <laughs> so it, you know, your conscious mind lies to you a lot. And so, um, so you have these, these two parts of your mind. You have your subconscious, which is clearer. You have your conscious, which is kind of all over the place. Uh, slide before with all the words <laughs> doing that. and. They but they both feed off the same well or pool of information that you've, you've put in there, um, that you've collected. Uh, so, and then, to, you know, another sort of piece about the, the conscious mind is, uh, you know, Michael Pollan was being interviewed by Terry Gross on NPR for his book where he talks about hallucinogenics and their ability to help with depression and people with uh, terminal diagnoses. And he says, um, you know, in depression, our mind tells us stories that we're not worthy of love, we're not good enough. 
And these become ruminative loops um, that are very hard to get out of, and they're destructive patterns of thought. And we do that too as when we're seeking to create, and we push in the wrong ways at the wrong times. Uh, it's that, that hitting a brick wall, um, feeling like nothing good is coming out, like you want to give up. And that's, that's, again, your frenemy, the conscious mind, just getting in the way. Because it's also thinking about picking up the kids. It's also thinking about dinner. It's also thinking about uh, the bill that you forgot to pay. It's also thinking about all of these other things that are always in the front of the mind. Um, so it's incredibly critically important in this process to settle your conscious mind. And I think we all have ways of doing it. There's meditation. There's, there, you know, I go for walks. I play guitar. Or there's picking up another project and starting with that and just allowing that subconscious the time to do the uh, incubation piece um, and, and do that heavy lifting. Uh, you know, and again, um, that the subconscious, you know, Michael Pollan said in that same interview, the subconscious is the part of the brain where the self talks to itself. So there's like a communication that's going on within you that you're not even a part of that you need to allow to have happen. Um, he goes on to say it's a group of structures that connect parts of the cortex to deeper levels where emotion and memory reside. Again, this, this plots with uh, Wagner and what he was saying uh, and is very true. Um, it's also where we have self-reflection. It's also where we have theory of the mind, which is our ability to ascribe mental and emotional states to other people, which is incredibly important. And it's where we keep the autobiographical self. Um, which sometimes feeds into depression, but also feeds into um, self-confidence and feeling like you can uh, manage various things. And that sometimes seems to come from nowhere, you think, but really it's that subconscious mind uh, saying, nope, <laughs> I got the truth back here. Don't listen to the guy in the front. Um, <laughs> and so theory of the mind is important for me. And, uh, uh, you know, it's, and, and again, it's used by psychologists to describe the ability of humans to attribute mental states, beliefs, intents, emotions, desires, the ability to, to pretend um, onto others and to understand how they're different from ourselves. Um, now, it's often used in reference to kids have, who have Asperger's and they have a social deficit. They're not able to read social cues, so they can't develop an accurate theory of the mind. Um, so part of what I want to do in my research is develop an accurate theory of the mind of my client and their emotional state. What are they seeking? Um, you know, and, and to have empathy for them, but also to be able to elicit some empathy from them for me. And empathy meaning that they do believe um, that I care and they do believe that I really want to provide a great solution for them, a great uh, uh, manuscript. And, and that requires them to have an accurate theory of mind of myself. So I have to be very uh, cognitive of the words that I use and the phrasing that I use. Um, because if I don't, uh, in, you know, in writing, if you don't give the right clues at the right time in the right way to the reader, it's almost like giving them Asperger's. And they're not going to be able to develop a, a proper theory of the mind for your characters, for the situation, for the uh, emotional issues that they face, and they're not going to be able to um, uh, engage their empathy, which is what you want to do as a writer. You always want to engage the reader's empathy. That's like the biggest, hugest, most important piece. And you want to use characterization, dialogue, scene, setting, description, um, all of those pieces, all of those tools that are in your skill set of your craft have to be directed towards uh, engaging that empathy. Um, and if you get it wrong, uh, they're just not going to get it. You know, you've, you've put them in a position where it's almost as if they have Asperger's. Um, so as a writer, we use things like paralanguage, which is tone and pitch, kinesics, which is gestures and other body movements, uh, micro expressions, physiological changes such as pupils dilating, warm sensations. We want to get not the big ones, you know, a bit of dialogue, he yelled. And if you have to say he yelled after a bit of dialogue where somebody's yelling, you failed. Um, <laughs> so, but to where the, the reader feels and senses their tension and they have the information that they need to understand the basis and, and source of that tension. Um, so by settling the conscious mind, the subconscious, uh, the, all these back-end neural structures and pathways are allowed to incubate information and create ideas. 
that then sets you up for you know what I, the illumination phase, which is the, you, you get to harvest your blinks, right? So you do your homework, you fill the well, uh, you try a few things, you do a few doodles, and then you step away from it, and you let the ideas come. Um, you know, and it's important, there's a difference too, a lot of people talk about flow state, where you're just in the moment, and that's great for musicians because they want to get there. They want to get inside the music and uh, be inside the moment. As a writer, I don't really want to do that. I used to try to do that, and the result was often, um, you know, <laughs> writing that was obtuse <laughs> to the <laughs> needs of the reader, uh, incoherent, and quite frankly, narcissistic. <laughs> because you're not creating, you're not finding what you need, which is a balance between the front and the back. So the, the back brings forward the ideas and then the front evaluates them and puts them into action where you can then evaluate them again and you can work on them. And writing like any other creative act is revising. And so you put down your first effort, effort revise it and revise it until you feel that you're happy with it. Uh, you know, and there's the, the myth of whenever you see a writer or a painter or a creative in a movie, they have some big aha moment clack, 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 and then three months later, you know, their agent calls and says, it's beautiful, it's going to sell a million copies, you know. <laughs> it, it, does, it doesn't happen. Maybe some people do. For me, I've never had that experience. <laughs> I would like to. It's a lot more work, um, but it's very satisfying and, and very pleasing uh, work. So, um, so, like I said, there's a number of ways that you can settle your conscious mind, and I'm, I'm not going to be the expert on it. For some people, it's meditation. For some people, it's taking a walk, going on a bike ride, picking up another project, uh, talking to somebody, making a phone call. It can be all kinds of things. Um, you know, like I said, meditation. Um, so do what works for you, what, what stops your mind, really, and gets it focused on something else. Um, and then, uh, so really, you've, you've done your homework, you've filled the well with uh, you know, all the information. Um, you've taken your conscious mind kind of out of the equation, so it's no longer lying to you and, and getting in the way. Um, and then your subconscious is taking the time to incubate uh, these things. You step away, um, you stop thinking on the subject, which breaks that uh, ruminating loop that Michael Pollan talked about. Um, and then once the subconscious is, has really been processing its work, uh, you got to be ready for lightning to strike because <laughs> these things fire forward and I've lost more good ideas than I've kept <laughs> because I don't have a piece of paper, I don't have a way to record. Um, you know, so this is why so many writers say carry around a notebook, and it, it really is true. Carry around a notebook or use your phone or have some way to capture these blinks as they come because you're not in, really totally in control of it. Um, I will send myself, the time where my ideas seem to come the most is as I'm reading before bed. And so I'll send myself five, six, seven, sometimes ten emails at night with ideas, and the next morning, uh, and I just write down what's coming from the subconscious. So the next morning I look at it and I can evaluate and sometimes I go, no, that's not quite right. But most of the time I go, yes, this is what I wanted and here's where I can put it. Um, so, uh, so really the process, do your homework, fill the well, do your, uh, some thinking, some ideation, some doodling, some creating, get away from it, let the subconscious do its work, and then almost wait for those answers to come. Um, and this is, for me, when I'm under that pressure where I have to prepare a pitch for a client and I've got a day or a few hours, this is the only uh, sort of programmatic or structured way that I can find to really get to a deeper way of thinking. Because if I just try and do it from here, uh, it never works and I get frustrated and the, the end product uh, is never good. And so, uh, so if I'm lucky enough to, to win the client, uh, you know, I use all these things all over again because now I have to create 60,000 to 80,000 words in a manuscript that uh, prove that I was right to tell them <laughs> I could do this and they're right to pay me uh, my fee and help them achieve their goals, solve their problem, uh, create a manuscript that engages the reader by eliciting an empathetic response, um, delivers a solution that has great value um, and that the reader can't 
get anywhere else. And uh, so I get the, the, the work and I sit down to this again, <laughs> go through my process uh, of the homework, and this comes back, but in there is a coherent story idea. And that's what I do. So thank you. I <laughs>